Hello everyone and welcome to another exciting edition of the ESQ Practical Lawyers Academy Free Webinar. I'm glad you could join us here today. My name is Chijima Agun and I'm a research and development associate at ESQ Trainings Limited. At ESQ Trainings Limited, our mission is to expand the frontiers of um, continuous professional learning with courses and trainings across various areas of practice. We have tagged this webinar series, the lunch hour webinar series, as they're slated to hold at 1 p.m. during lunch break. They will hold three times every week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. However, in order to accommodate our Muslim participants, the Friday webinars will hold at 11 a.m. And after every session, we'll provide the resources in easily accessible formats for everyone who's interested. So you can now watch our um, webinars on our YouTube at my ESQ legal. And after watching, please kindly subscribe for more premium content. So on today's topic, we'll be discussing the legal regime on ship arrest. And some of the things that will be discussed today will be on um, the detailed understanding of laws governing um, arrest proceedings in Nigeria, a good understanding of maritime lands, knowledge of the costs, expenses, and fees implication of a ship arrest, and many more that are speakers will want to touch on today so please if you have any question during the webinar please um, type them in the q and a or raise your hand and in due time it will be answered so um i'll leave um, mr olushola to introduce our panelists and then moderate the webinar thank you thank you so much uh Chilema. just to uh, save time uh, i'm going to introduce uh, each panelist at, at uh, just when it is their time to speak. So the first person to the first speaker uh, is uh, a very well respected and accomplished uh, maritime practitioner in the person of uh, Mrs. Jean Chiazo Anishere. Uh, Ms. Chiazo holds uh, an LLB from Obama Law University in 1985. How old is I then? Uh, master LLM from the University of Lagos um, and also a master in in transport management from Ladoke Akinsola University. She was called to Nigeria in 1986, sworn uh, notary public of Nigeria in 1990. She has, she has she was awarded International Women of the Year in 1997 to 1998 by the International Biographical Center of Cambridge in recognition of her services to law and the international professional of the year 2005 for excellent uh, practice in the field of law. She has a very integrating CV. I, 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 I will plead with her. She's a member of the International Bar Association, the uh, Charter Institute of Arbitrators UK, Maritime Arbitrators Association, Nigeria Maritime Law Association, past president, women in shipping in Nigeria, president, women in maritime, uh, organization, Women Africa, role model in transport and logistics in Nigeria, could go on and on and on and on. Um, it, it is my my pleasure with delight to introduce uh, and welcome um, Mrs. Uh, Chiazo Anishere. Of course, I didn't say, I didn't mention that she is also a senior advocate of Nigeria. Please, let's welcome uh, Mrs. Anishere S.A. and she takes, as she takes us on the first topic, she'll be speaking on timelines and processes for arresting a vessel in Nigeria. You're welcome. Let us see. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to be part of this great seminar on the very interesting theme, which is ship arrest and judicial sale of vessels in Nigeria. One of my favorites. Our topic this afternoon is on timelines and processes for arresting a vessel in Nigeria. Now first, let's look at the outlines. Okay, on the outline we have, by way of introduction, we need to appreciate what a ship is. What is a ship in maritime law? And of course, we'll go straight to the topic which is the timelines for arresting a vessel in Nigeria, the processes for arresting a vessel in Nigeria, and we'll come to birth by way of conclusion. So let's start the engine. Right, so what is a ship in maritime law? A lot of people have various definitions for what 
a sheep is. But let's suffice it to say that a sheep is the same as a vessel. A vessel under the section 26 of the Agnostic Jurisdiction Act is defined as a vessel of any kind used or constructed for use in navigation by water, howsoever it is propelled or moved. Can you please move the slide? Howsoever it is propelled, I can see that. Also, if it is propelled or moved and includes right a barge, lighter or other floating vessel, including a drilling rig. It also includes a hovercraft or an offshore industry mobile unit and a vessel that has sunk or is stranded and remains of uh, the strand and the remains of such vessel, but does not include the vessel under construction that has not been launched. Now, so that is the definition of a vessel or a ship in maritime law as defined under section 26 of the Admiralty Jurisdiction Act of 1991. Now, having said that, there's this interesting case of Ong Chekwa and Akan. The decision on that in that case, as a judge by Justice UKJ of the Federal High Court, is quite an interesting decision. His lordship in that case defined a ship or a vessel to mean a traditional engineless fishing canoe. A traditional engineless fishing canoe. Now, of course, its lordship must have derived her definition from section 26 of the AJA that says a hovercraft, a floating vessel, Um, you know, that is propelled in any which way, you know, that is quite an interesting definition. And so going by that definition, an engineless fishing canoe, traditional one for that matter, has been adjudged to be a ship in maritime law. So it's important therefore that we appreciate the five points noted under section 26 of the AJA as defining what a ship is in maritime law. Further definition can be seen under the Cabotage Act of 203. Under the Cabotage Act of 203, move the slide please. Thank you. A vessel or a ship is defined as a ship, a boat, hovercraft, or craft, including air cushion vehicles and dynamically supported craft, designed, used, or capable of being solely or partly used for marine navigation and used for carriage on, through, or underwater of persons or property without regard to method or lack of propulsion. Without regard to method or lack of propulsion. This might be another reason why the detection in Omuchekwe and Akon is taken as a traditional engineless fishing canoe to be a ship. We also want to look at the definition as stated in the Merchant Shipping Act of 1990. Now, Machine Shipping Act of 2007, sorry. The Machine Shipping Act, please. All right, so it's safe time. The MSA 207 defines a ship or a vessel as any vessel other than 
a vessel propelled solely by oars or paddles and as including barges, lighters, and other light vessels used in navigation in Nigeria and howsoever propelled, howsoever propelled. And that is as shown on the section of relevant section of the Merchant Shipping Act 207. Now, having said all that, one can rightly conclude that a vessel or a ship in maritime law is simply a floating vessel which is self propelled and capable of carrying cargo or passengers. Right, now we have managed to define a ship in maritime law. Now we can appreciate the timelines for the arrest of a vessel in Nigeria. The timelines. Now, Order 7, Rule 11, or Rule 1, Sub 1 of the AJPR states thus. A party to a proceeding commenced as an action in REM may by a motion ex parte apply for warrant of arrest in respect of a ship or other property against which the proceeding was commenced, provided that at the time of application, the ship of the property is within Nigerian territorial waters or is expected to arrive within three days. So summarily, what it means is that to arrest a vessel in Nigeria, you have to come by way of motion ex parte. And so by way of motion ex parte means you filed an application without putting the other party on notice. That is fast enough. Furthermore, you could file your application within three days to the arrival of the ship. One would now ask the question, how would one know when the ship will arrive in Nigerian territorial waters to enable you to compute the three days uh, period? There is uh, what we know as the shipping position. There are some journals that you know, provide shipping position for vessels. Again, you could get the, to know when the vessel will arrive by approaching the shipping line. Of course, you don't tell them that you want to arrest their vessel. So that's why you want to know when the vessel will be arriving. So you'll be, you'll be diplomatic about it. But I know that there are some journals and there's Lloyd's, you can go on the internet to trace the arrival of the vessel. And that would enable you count the three day period to bring your application. Uh, so you have your application ready, you have the order ready within the three day period. And as soon as the vessel arrives in our waters, you can now serve the vessel with the arrest warrant. So three days um, to the arrival of the vessel in our territorial waters and by way of motion ex parte. Motion ex parte shows the speed at which the application should be brought. Furthermore is that a plaintiff may now commence in rem proceedings against a vessel once she is within jurisdiction. And in rem proceedings is when the action is against a vessel or the property. So there is a distinction between an action in REM and an action in persona. In REM is when the action is against the vessel itself as a risk or a property. And the in persona is against the owner of the vessel, the charter, and you know, not the not the not the vessel, but the owners or the charters, or the person in whose possession the vessel is. It could be the master of the vessel. 
Now, further on the timelines, we also need to appreciate the fact that claims arising from an action in REM with a string of urgency, especially because the ship being an international business too, may leave the jurisdiction of the court at any time. So such claims must be brought with a string of urgency. So your application in support of the motion ex parte must have attached there to an affidavit of urgency. So you're gonna have two, two affidavits. The first affidavit attached to the motion ex parte would read an affidavit of urgency. The second affidavit is the affidavit attached to the motion ex parte itself. So you have three sets of documents, affidavit of urgency, the motion ex parte, and the affidavit in support of the motion ex parte. The reason is we're able to obtain an instant date from the registry for the hearing of your motion ex parte. Oftentimes such motions could be heard in chambers of the judges or they could be heard in open court. But what is important is that the affidavit of urgency shows the registrar the urgency why the court should give hearing of the to the application instanta. So that is very key. To this end, the plaintiff is expected together with other originating processes, file the writ, file the statement of claim. But uh, like I said earlier, the affidavit of urgency, the motion ex parte and the affidavit attached there to are very key documents. A prudent owner or an interested person of a ship under arrest is anxious to have his vessel quickly released to him in order to mitigate the colossal damages and costs incurred during the period of arrest. And so I have here the case of Maxwell Ebube and the Gold Star Line. In that case, the vessel was arrested as soon as it came within Nigerian territorial waters. And in the book by Christopher Hill, the timeline given was described as instant, although the word used in that case was pounce. During the validity of the rate or a time to pounce on the wrist when it comes within jurisdiction. Now what happened in that case was that the order of arrest had been obtained and the arrestor was simply waiting for the vessel to arrive Nigerian territorial waters. And as soon as the, the vessel arrived, the warrant of arrest was served on the vessel. So the word pounds shows the speed, the instant um, service of the warrant of arrest on the vessel. So that is very important to pounce on the wrist when it comes within jurisdiction as an excellent way of getting the owner of the wrist within the plaintiff's grasp. And so a warrant of arrest is valid for six months from the date of issue and can be renewed for another six months. That is as provided under the seven rule three of the AJPR. So we, you know that your warrant of arrest has a lifespan of six months and it's renewable at the expiration of the first six months. So that's as far as the timelines go. And the next subtopic is the process for arresting a vessel in Nigeria. There are two remarkable conventions of arrest. The first convention is a 1952 arrest convention. But before we go to that arrest convention, it's important for us to note that these conventions were necessitated to provide uniformity amongst countries with respect to the arrests of ships. The first conference where the issue of arrest of ship was discussed was in 1930, and four questions were raised. One, which ship 
may be arrested. Two, who is entitled to arrest? Three, where can arrest be made? And how can a sheep be, a, be released from arrest? These questions led to a compromise between the French remedy of says the conservator, which means detention of sheep in an action in rem. Having said that, now we look at the two conventions. The first one is 1952 convention, which unified the rules and procedures of an arrest. It also allowed the arrest of a ship flying flag of one of the contracting states in jurisdiction of any other contracting states in respect to any maritime claim, but in respect of same claim in a contracting state after a previous arrest was made. However, this convention was not without its fault, just like any other convention anyway. It contained a closed list of claims which did not reflect the realities of shipping. This is one of its faults. It also had certain linguistic nuances which created a difference in the way the common law and civil law dealt with the ship matter of arrest, or the subject matter of arrest. The words of the convention were unclear, and this led to different interpretation by national courts. Now, due to these shortcomings, the 1999 arrest convention was enacted. The 1999 Arrest Convention was, has been domesticated in Section 2 of the AJA. This provides for claims for satisfaction and enforcement of judgments. The Convention also provides for claims for interest, claims for ports and other dues, claims for insurance premiums, and claims for enforcement of arbitral awards. Okay. So quickly on that, I, I have just two minutes ago, I've been given the red flag. The arrest convention is a convention that uh, Nigeria has domesticated. And the arrest convention is as provided under section two of the AJA. Now I will now go on to the procedure for arrest. I have just two minutes, so help me God on how to do that. Oh, the seven of AJPR or the seven rule one of the AJPR is actually the provisions of uh, arrest. The provisions of the AJPR show the procedure for arrest, which is commenced by filing a writ of summons, statement of claim, a motion ex parte, as I said earlier, disclosing strong prima facie case for the arrest of the sheep with supporting affidavit stating the nature of the claim. And I've also added a rider that you must have an affidavit of urgency attached there too. Now quickly order seven rule six of the AJPR 2011 also states that the affidavit must depose to certain facts. And those facts you will find in the paper. That is the nature of the claim, the name of the sheep and and so on and so forth. These facts are very important that you have them uh, deposed to in your affidavit in support of the motion ex parte. Now, if the court finds it reasonable to make the arrest, the ship becomes a security for the determined compensating cost and an object to be sold to satisfy the claim. And finally, other six, Rules 1 to 15 of the AJPR also describe the methods and procedure for service of processes. This is very important. I could only summarize by saying that to serve the warrant of arrest on a ship, you only do that by serving on the mast of the ship. All right, you could also drop the arrest warrant. You could serve it on the master of the vessel if you can get to meet the master if he accepts it or you could just leave it in the vessel but it's important that the writ of summons and your 
motion ex parte and the other documents are served on the mask of the vessel. That will suffice at service on the vessel to arresting the vessel. The case study is the case of Arabella and the case of MV Kotamanis. These cases are on service uh, processes on the vessel. The case of Arabella referred to the service by way of Section 97 of the Sheriff and Civil Processes Act, and that has been seen not to be good service. You don't need to seek leave of court to serve your originating processes on the vessel, either through the master or, or whoever is in charge of the vessel. It is sufficient if it's an admiralty matter in REM to wait arresting a vessel that you serve the vessel with the originating processes by serving it on the mast of the vessel or serving on the master if the master accepts the processes from you. But the man is also on pause with Arabella, but that is not good service as it stands today, going by AJA. And by way of conclusion, it is obvious that arrest of ships is a well-known maritime practice or well-recognized maritime practice internationally. It is an effective tool in the hands of the claimant which prevents the vessel from sailing away, thereby frustrating the claimant's claim. So the arrest gives the defendant the opportunity to put up a bail or provide an advance of the judgment sum, and it provides adequate funds to secure compliance with any judgment that may eventually be awarded against it or its owners. So the right to pre-judgment arrest of a defendant's assets to secure a potential claim originated as an exception to the general principle that such rights accrue only upon final judgment. Thus arose a distinctive feature of the courts of admiralty. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Leonard, uh, Senior Advocate of Nigeria for that. A uh, very well presented paper um, on the timelines and processes for arresting the vessel in Nigeria. There are three questions you may want to note uh, the, uh, the Q and A uh, session. Three questions by this question by Constance Magbemi of Abolani Abdul Salam and Prof. Dr. Wale Olawun Essien. Uh, you may want to note those questions, and then uh, I'll please. Um, Direct, can we direct all questions to the Q&A section of the Zoom uh, metro so we can always take it during the Q&A uh, when it is time for us to take the question and answer. Uh, please, uh, if you're just joining us, please note that Mr. Femi Atoyebi will be joining us at 2 p.m. Uh, to take an overview of the laws governing arrest proceedings uh, in Nigeria. And uh, the next speaker is Mr. Ali Keliani. Mr. Ali Keliani is a very good friend of mine and he's uh, an executive uh, claims officer for the uh, London Ship Owners Club. Um, uh, you know, over the years in my uh, practice as a, as a maritime practitioner, I've received uh, several questions and inquiries from, uh, from PNI clubs uh, and um, foreign clients just 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 to say that on on their expectations when their vessels or their members vessels have been arrested in nigeria or in any of the african sub uh, so mr ali keliani will take us on ship owners or club expectations from local council during ship arrests uh, or during ship release uh claims mr ali you want to take it up from there you have 15 minutes and i'm going <laughs> To monitor you with military precision. <laughs> very well, very well. Thank you, Olu Shola. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, all right. So, um, just to give you a bit of context uh, from a club's perspective, um, it's often uh, it'll be uh, a Friday afternoon. 
everybody's waiting for the weekend, uh, getting ready for the weekend, and suddenly a surveyor or our local correspondents or local lawyers email us telling us that uh, the claimants are going to arrest the vessel in a couple of hours if we don't give them security. So hopefully that gives you a sense of the uh, urgency. Um, so in terms of, uh, I think the, one of the first things we always ask for of our lawyers is um, the details. So firstly, what is the actual claim? Sometimes it's obvious. Vessel has been discharging cargo, then we can assume that it's a shortage or cargo contamination. But other times, we have to <coughs> just have to check. So sometimes it might be a claim that isn't covered by under the PR. And then equally important is the uh, date of the alleged incident. So again, if that, if it happened in the past, then uh, we need to know the date to make sure that the vessel was entered that we were uh, covering it at the time. Uh, do the claimants have a title to sue? So, um, are we addressing the security to the correct party, someone who uh, yeah, has a title to sue? Um, what levels of security is being demanded? Um, is it at a reasonable level? And if not, is it possible to get to level? So um, if it's too high, then we'd like our lawyers to um, uh, be able to negotiate the, the amount down to a reasonable level. That said, it is only um, security, so uh, it's not necessarily the final claim amount. So if push comes to shove and the vessel won't be um, able to sail, then we may be able to compromise with the level of security. Um, and then also, if the amount is low and uh, our surveyor or our correspondents believe that um, there, is a li there, there is liability on our members part, and um, then, then we might look to uh, settle, see if we can settle. So it's, it's always an option we need to consider because it's better to um, settle straight away and save everyone the hassle than to um, security, which can be quite a long process. And uh, acceptable forms of security. So is it a LOU, a bank guarantee or cash guarantee? Obviously um, we prefer club standard LOU wordings or at least something as close to the club's wording as possible. And um, you'll see below my final bullet point, I've um, just put a few, it's by no means an exhaustive list, but a few of the um, uh, characteristics of an LOU wording which we look for. So um, obviously the, um, we'd only give an LOU on the condition that the vessel is released by the claimant or not arrested at all, if it hasn't been arrested yet. And then uh, we want to make sure that the, um, the wording is only security and not a um, settlement agreement. So we would like, um, ideally, we would like something along the lines of um, something that says that uh, we will pay an amount subject to negotiations between our members and the claimant or something that is um, uh, awarded by the courts of a competent jurisdiction. So we're not just um, basically agreeing to pay the claimants the amount of the um, security being put up. And then of course, um, the security isn't an admission of liability and without prejudice to any rights or defences of our members. So of course, we will be able to um, uh, bring raise our arguments when um, negotiating. And then um, English law to govern the LOU, that is a preference, but of course we'd open, we'd be open to consider other jurisdictions, perhaps the Nigerian jurisdiction, but our preference is generally English law because we, we know more about it and we know about the process. So it's, um, it gives us more peace of mind. And then um, moving on. So best practice, um, keep the club closely informed. It's, uh, we always get a lot of questions from the, the members panicking because they won't be able to sell, uh, their vessel won't be able to sell and they might um, lose hire and they might have to pay port dues. And then the broker is also chasing because the members chasing them. So it's good that um, it'd be good if our lawyers could um, keep us informed, let us know what's going on so that we can um, then keep our brokers and members informed as well. And then uh, be clear and responsive, please. Uh, if, uh, if we have any questions, then uh, it's always good to have a good explanation because 
when we put up when we give security we have to claims handlers have to get the approval of the managers and then perhaps the directors depending on the level and they'll ask, they'll be asking us a, a load of questions as well so it would be good to have all the answers prepared for them for when we go and speak to them and um, it and it will help avoid delays as well and also um, if an LOU if an LOU won't be accepted then what are the other possible solutions basically how can we get let us know our options on how to get the vessel released as soon as possible that is the uh, the main thing and then um, as I previously mentioned before the um, uh, club LOU is preferred and of course um, we're coming under a lot of pressure from the members they want to set sail for the next fixture and they don't want to have to pay the port dues so um, so yeah our best efforts should be made to um, ensure that the vessel has is able to um, sail when it is due to sail or and also before close of business I think Nigeria and England are on the same time so um, around 5 5 15 if, if we can get everything sorted by then because after 5.15, our managers go home or the directors go home. And then so it's very difficult for the claims handler to then get approval of the LOU if, uh, after that. And then um, be prepared to attempt negotiations for the level of security and the LOU wording. Sometimes uh, we have a security request and um, the claimants are seeking a wording that is completely unreasonable and that we, we just cannot agree to. And then so at times our lawyers in various jurisdictions will insist to us that it is non-negotiable, but really it's sort of an unacceptable answer for us to refer to our managers. Our managers will want to know if we have made our, if we had tried our best to um, get a wording that is um, agreeable to the club so um, so yeah we need to show that we have uh, taken taken steps to uh, ensure that and then if it doesn't work if the claimants still insist on a wording at least we can tell our managers that um, this is the best we can do and um, yeah and then of course if the vessel is arrested then um, keep us informed of the court procedures how long will it take when do the courts open or close uh, what do the courts need? for us to, um, for them to uh, arrest, the, uh, release the vessel. And um, yeah, just keep us informed. I think the, uh, the main point I think I'm trying to make is that it's, it's all very, very urgent. We need to get the vessel released. Everyone's becoming, coming under a lot of pressure from each other so that the vessel can sail immediately. But then sometimes if, um, if a, uh, if the terms aren't agreeable to both parties, then sometimes the club has to is has to be prepared to step down and say we cannot give security on under these terms, and um, the vessel has to be uh, remain arrested. But that is a last resort, a last resort. And um, I think that is that is it. Nice and quick. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. And also, my email address is below. If um, you would like to email me anything at a later date. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ali, for your um, paper and thank you for keeping the time as well. I, I can assure you there are a lot of questions uh, that will come up, uh, but we cannot take all the questions now. So uh, I was about to ask you some questions, but I, I, I understand Mr. Femi Atoyebi is already online. Uh, he's already with us. so. Uh, I'm going to quickly introduce Mr. Femia Toyebi to take his paper. After then, Mr. Akago Akabo will come on board and then we'll take the Q&A session. Uh, then we'll try to close from there. Uh, so let me quickly introduce the next speaker, Mr. Femi Peter, Ulua Femi Peter Toyebi needs no introduction. Um, he's synonymous with maritime practice in Nigeria. Um, I mean, he, he, he's, he's seen it all, he's seen it all. Uh, he's a founding partner of Femi Atoyebi and Co. since 1987 to, to, to date. Um, he was conferred with the rank of Senior Advocate of Nigeria in 2003. He is an astute and genius advocate uh, who specializes in maritime and commercial litigation. Um, he has successfully engaged in 
various business advisory spectrum in Nigeria, especially in the maritime space. Um, uh, Mr. Femi Asoebi, uh, we've, I think in, in the course of my practice as a very young lawyer, I've read some of his uh, law, uh, in, in cases in the Supreme Court, Court of Appeal, and High Courts that he has uh, personally handled. And I've had the privilege um, while I was uh, a lawyer in the law firm of Anglican Captain Martins to have uh, uh, you know worked with him on a particular uh, ship arrest that involved uh, the federal government, the Office of the Nigerian Security Advisor, the Office of uh, it was a very highly highly technical uh, uh, subject. I wouldn't want to go into that, but uh, it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Mr. Femi Atoyi. You're welcome, sir. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Mr. Biloye, for your very kind and lavishing introduction. I think you took about five minutes out of my 15 in just introducing me. Simply, Mr. Femi Atoyi will have been sufficient. All right, thank you so much indeed, and for the organizers of this um, webinar. Uh, I think it's quite... Uh, um, um, very, very illuminating, I should say. I'm not privileged to have listened to Dr. Lawan, but I know him very well. He's my dear Abura friend. Um, so I know, uh, of course, I will take his own a copy of his paper, but I can imagine he would have done justice to his paper. I managed to catch my learned friend, uh, my, my learned brother, Silk, Jim, cheers all. I think the last 15 or 20 minutes of our paper. Um, excellent, excellent. Well done. Thank you so much, Ma. And of course, um, Mr. Kilani, on the way the, or the expectations of Chanai clubs. Thank you so much indeed. Um, I'm supposed to be speaking for 15 minutes, so it's quite difficult. Uh, when I'm asked to review or to do an overview of the laws governing arrest proceedings in Nigeria, uh, listening to my learned brother Silk, she has, um, I think, uh, maybe the subject they gave us, that's a kind of overlap. So she's dealt with quite a few of those, but I will still just go on and discuss this. Hopefully, whatever we miss out, we can deal with during the Q&A. All right, excuse me. The first thing I would like to point out is as to the court that has jurisdiction on matters of arrest of ships. And I know it sounds a little bit um, basic. Why would anybody be talking of that at this stage? Very quickly, because we don't have time, of course, we know that in matters of arrest of ships and other maritime assets, only the Federal High Court has exclusive jurisdiction to arrest ships. We're not talking about the subject matter now. Now, the reason I say that is, at least I'm involved in no less than two cases in which the legal states high court purported to arrest ships. So but let's get that correctly. Of course, both of them were thrown out, were set aside on the basis of a want of jurisdiction. Um, so that's the first thing I want to deal with very, very quickly. And then, before we get into the laws, which I, as I noted earlier, my learned brother Silk, um, Jean Chiazo, has already dealt with, or dealt with part of it. It's also important to highlight what assets may be arrested under the admiralty jurisdiction of the court. Again, even the title said arrest of ships, I see it is only the ship that can be arrested as security for a maritime claim. No. Um, so the maritime assets that can be arrested apart from ships are cargo, whether they be wet cargo, whether they be dry cargo, whatever type of cargo, bulk cargo, in appropriate circumstances, they can be arrested as security for a maritime claim. Also freight, the freight that an owner would probably earn for charging the ship may be arrested. And of course, charter hire as well, 
what is due to the owners from the charter, which is higher, may be arrested in the hands of whoever I think that has it. They all are what I call maritime rest, uh, against which an action may properly proceed. And they can be named as parties, simpliciter. Um, of course, bonkers is the fourth or the fifth maritime asset that can be arrested. Now that's important. Let me explain something here. Um, bonkers is not every action that can be directly um, issued against bonkers of the ship. Of course, in practical terms, the arrest of bonkers is effectively is practically the arrest of the ship. But you are not proceeding against the ship, but the bonkers. And a claim can only properly be made against the bunkers for a claim against time charters. So where a time charter is owing someone else and it has bunkers on the ship he has chartered, you may not actually proceed against the ship because there is no nexus, no legal nexus between the claimant and the ship owner. But usually, the bunkers on board the ship belongs to the time charter and you can proceed against that. Of course, once you get the bunkers arrested, the vessel is arrested and then we can take issues from there. Then we go to the, to the sources of the uh, um, laws. These are part of the things that Mrs. Charles or SAN has dealt with. The first, the original in Nigeria source of laws for the arrest of vessels or other maritime uh, assets in Nigeria is the International Convention for the Unification of Certain Rules relating to the arrest of ocean going vessels of 1952, simply known as the Arrest Convention of 1952. On the 7th of November, 1963, Nigeria acceded to this convention. I'm sure you know the law about international conventions. And so Nigeria became a signatory to the convention in 1963. So from about that time, that was the law that was governing arrest of ships in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Of course, prior to that time, that is prior to the 1952 arrest convention, we had the English Administration of Justice Act of 1956, which I'm sure we're all aware of, which of course is made applicable because it was a pre-1960 act. Um, it sets out also the jurisdictions and the powers of the local courts to arrest um, maritime assets. And of course, since 1963, the first mention we had of arrest of ships and what conferred jurisdiction on the court to the Nigerian court to arrest ship was actually more procedural than substantive. And that is contained, or that was contained in order 21 of the Federal High Court Civil Procedure Rules of 1976. And of course that that rule was just one rule. I, I believe it's sub rule A and B and just provides for, was very scanty, uh, but that was the authority, every application then to arrest a ship or other maritime asset was predicated on order 21 of the 1976 rules of the Federal High Court, the general procedure rules. Now, this was position until the 30th of December, 1991, when decree number 59 of 1991 was promulgated. And that, again, I think, um, Jane, if you don't mind me just referring to you simply as Jane, uh, I'll be there too. That's the Administration, Admir sorry, pardon me, Ad Admiralty Jurisdiction Act of 1991. Number 59 was a decree of force. And two years later, that, that was quite exhausting, especially sections one, and two, and then section five. 
So we want to really note sections one, two, three, and five, essentially, um, which of course time will not allow us to deal with in greater details at this, at this time. And of course, the substantive laws as it is in all cases will, pro will provide the, the law, the governing law, the enabling law. And then the rules are where the procedure is set out. And so in 1993, we had the um, Admiralty Jurisdiction Procedure Rules of 1993, which set out um, the, the, the nitty grit, if you like, of how to process uh, an action in REM for an arrest of a maritime rest. Now, of course, um, lately in 2011, precisely on the 4th of March, 2011, we had the current Ad, Ad, um, Admiralty Jurisdiction Procedure Rules. That is, that's the extant rule that we have today governing the operations of applications for ship arrest um, and other assets. Now, when we talk of the laws governing arrest of ships, strictly speaking, those will be it. But I think it will be a bit narrow to, to limit it to those. So I would then like to speak to us about two things. Broadly speaking, there are two, two types of arrests of maritime assets. The first with which I believe we are more concerned this afternoon is what I call the judicial arrest. That's the one that is processed through the courts. That's one I believe we all have been talking about, judicial arrest. But then there is the what I call the extrajudicial arrest as well, which is not uncommon actually in Nigeria. And those are arrests at the instance of various government agencies for allegedly breaching one of their enabling act or the other. I can give you a few because of time. In those days before this, the MPA concessioned the ports, they, they exercised the power to detain ships without going to court. I'm not saying this was right, but they did it. That's why I call it extrajudicial. Then we have Nemasa. There were lots of arrests by Nemasa, especially in the early days of their operations, and many of which were challenged, they would just refuse to give outward selling certificate to a ship. There's no court order, but they allege they have been in breach of one thing or the other under their act. So therefore, you cannot sail. They will not give you the um, outward saving certificate. And of course, no ship will depart one port without that because you must, you must tender that when you arrive at your next port. So the master two and being another agency of government has been responsible for what I call extrajudicial arrest. And of course, when that is challenged, especially if you went to court, then they are bound to come to court to explain why they are holding on to the vessels or whatever assets that they have arrested. And of course, um, uh, NGLEA, is there as I speak. I currently we're doing uh, a naughty matter with the NDLEA because they allegedly found some cocaine on board uh, a ship and we've been there for forever. Customs also do detain ships. I mean, there's so several, no, several other agencies of government in Nigeria engage in what I call extrajudicial arrest. So it's important for us to know the enabling act. They would, because eventually, when, for instance, a lawyer issues a threat to any of those agencies for unlawfully detaining the ship without a court order, they then rush to court. But they could have held the ship for a month, for two months. And of course, we have the Navy, we have, I mean, for what they call illegal bond crane, so many things that are not necessarily 
um, relating directly to arrest of ships. So what we want to be aware of, what we want to be conversant with, are uh, every agency, every government department, MDAs operating in relation to a ship or maritime business, because a breach of any of those the regulations will entitle them, in most cases, to proceed against the ship for, uh, for an arrest or even the cargo, even the cargo. Um, that for me would be, and then of course, uh, uh, another source of, if you call it a law for the arrest of ships would be case law. Case law that, that, cut, that, that there have been quite a number of decisions of um, the Federal High Court, the Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court that have also established in an attempt to interpret one law or the other, the uh, 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 basis or the rights that entitle um, an arrestor to proceed against the maritime rest. You could look, for instance, at the MV Darkinshan, which is a popular decision of the Court of Appeal, my Lord um, wife of JCA, as it then was. Um, for those of you who may need the citation, it's 1991, number eight, NWLR. 1991 8 NWLR part 209 page 354 particularly at 367 um again i know that um my my, my learned brother silk had also dealt with the purpose of an arrest because it's not just sufficient for you to understand the law why must i proceed against the ship and I, I will submit that there is a gross misconception amongst legal practitioners as to why the arrest of maritime rights was instituted in the first instance. So I will go through three very, before I uh, round up, three very quick uh, uh, reasons. Number one reason for a ship or maritime arrest is to obtain a pre-judgment security which means by the nature of ships and the things they carry, they're highly mobile. So if you were to, if you were to issue proceedings against a ship that was in Nigeria today, even if you have the fastest court procedure, okay, somebody wants me to give the authority again, so I will be doing that. It is the MV Da Kinshan, I'll spell that for you. It's spelled, I spell it phonetically, is Delta Alpha November, one word. Queen is spelled Quebec, uniform, India, November. And the third word, Shan, is Sierra Hotel Alpha November, dark in Shan. And it's reported in 1991. 8 NWLR part 209, page 354 at 367. It's a court of appeal decision. So I was I was given, you're most welcome. I was given uh, uh, the three basic reasons arrest, uh, the purposes for the arrest. The first one is to get a prejudgment. Okay, I'm getting a lot of messages. I'm sorry, and I'm being distraught, but I would ignore them. I will do what I need to do about it later. Yes, All right, please. so yes, yes, so the first purpose is to get a pre judgment security uh, because by the time you finish your case, the ship will have gone and probably could have been uh, uh, broken up, could have been sold on. So, what it does is to give you security ahead of any judgment, and the court keeps the security. And of course, if you if you get judgment, you can then proceed against it. That's number one. The reason that is important is it is not to punish a ship owner or charter, as the case may be. It is to get security. So if you can get your security, there's no point arresting the ship and walking away to the village and nobody sees you to agree terms of release. Number two reason is to confer on the court the jurisdiction which it would not otherwise have heard. What does that mean? 
the certain uh, 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 um, claims that the, the Nigerian court, the local court, it is the same thing with every jurisdiction over the world, will not have jurisdiction if not for the presence of the ship within its jurisdiction, which is why the client can instruct you from Ghana, from Europe, from America, or wherever, for, for uh, um, uh, um, some wrong committed by the ship in Singapore. You'll be able to do that if the ship is found in Nigeria and you arrest her, that confers jurisdiction on the court, which you would not otherwise have had. And finally, number three on that point was to compel the appearance of the uh, um, ship owner. As we know from the case of the Mustafa, the Court of Appeal was privileged also to have handled that. You could, you could sue just, you could name just the ship, the cargo, the bunkers, as defendants only, and you are not obliged to name the owners, except of course in the body of your claim as uh, an interested party or relevant, rather relevant party. So where you name the rest alone, what an arrest does is to naturally the owner of whatever it is will come and say, this is my asset, take security. I'm sure you're going to speak to Mr. Kilani, the p &I club and said, Please, can you get security for this man? So those are the three major uh, purposes for getting a ship arrested. I want to deal very quickly with section five, four of the uh, uh, AJA, Admiralty Jurisdiction Act. It's been a source of, uh, uh, um, a, a source of, I don't know what to call it, legal tosses between lawyers for opposing sides. And I think the point needs to be made. A lot of arrests are lost because attention has not been paid or is not being paid to the provisions of section five, subsection four. Now, of course, there is the offending sister arrest, and we don't have all the time. There is the sister, there is the sister vessel arrest by which is meant a vessel that belongs to the same ownership, and I stress ownership, the same ownership as the offending ship may be arrested. However, just because a ship belongs to the same management does not qualify the arrestor to proceed against her. As you know, managers of ships can have 50 or 100 ships they're managing. They're not the owners. So there is a duty on whoever wants to arrest the ship to do its diligent search and ensure that the ship you want to proceed against is actually owned by the party who offended you or it's a sister ship to the offending ship. Um, a lot of arrests have been lifted unconditionally just because somebody has not done his own work. I would recommend that we read the case of Allied Trading Company Allied Trading Company against GBN, initials GBN line. It's 1980 to 1986, two NSC, Nigerian shipping cases, 348 at 352. I also have here the MVSRR, but I think my time is up. Um, so basically section five first says, you can't just proceed against an asset by way of an arrest unless you can demonstrate that at the time you're you proceeding against that asset, it is fully owned by the party who has offended you. Otherwise, the arrest will be wrongful, it will be discharged unconditionally, and you may be liable to damages, for an action for damages or wrongful arrest. I believe my time is up. <laughs> Thank you so much again for uh, giving me this time to speak to the group. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, Leonard said for that very insightful and uh, I, I would dare say an intellectually stimulating uh, discourse. Um, you've heard it. And, and thank you also for giving us a very interesting perspective on the extra uh, judicial arrest. Um, uh, I, I wonder why how uh, just just a quick one before you before, of course, we're going to come to the uh, Q&A session. Um, uh, what what's actually uh, what's your take on um, the arrest um, by 
some of these uh, uh, government uh, regulators like the Nigerian Port Authority, like NIMASA. Um, for instance, I remember re very recently we, 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 we both worked on a particular matter where um, a vessel was arrested by the office of the NSA. The NSA was involved. And um, in fact, the, the Office of National Security of, uh, Advisor was, was, was so much interested in, in that vessel to ensure that it does not sail out of Nigerian waters. Um, in, in such scenario where it appears um, there's, there's a higher power up there and uh, I mean, as particularly, I'm, I'm saying this particularly given that we're speaking to there's many young lawyers. I mean, in this uh, in this meeting, what what is your best what is the best way to ensure that uh, the client expectations <clears throat> release of their vessel um, sailing out of jurisdiction is being expeditiously uh, attained? What what is the best the practical way? Because I mean, it's easy to say you want to go to court and get all right. Get what what's the best way from your own experience? Um, we can really assist in as young lawyers ensuring that um, client expectations, the, the vessels are being quickly released. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you understand, if you, if you get my, my, I my... do, I do, I do, I do. Thank you, Shola. Now, there is no one size fits all. It will have to depend on what agency and what is alleged infraction. The one to which you are leaded if I remember the facts correctly, it was during the transition from the Jonathan administration to the present administration in the first term, during the first term. Right. And the particular cargo was one that you needed a license because it, it, it can be used for a bomb. And it was only the NSA on side, the office of the NSA that, that issued the, the, the license to import which they had issued for this particular company. That was for the owners. I think you also on the side of the, maybe the charter so on. But the point was, meanwhile, there was a change of government. The license was to last for a year. Again, we know in shipping that when you want to import a cargo, it's not a one event thing. It's a process that goes on for six months or even longer, depending on what you're importing, when you get the fund and the uh, uh, steamy time of the ship. So in the meantime, by the time the ship arrived with the cargo, the government has changed hands. And of course, we all knew there was a problem with the, with the NSA, with the past NSA, because of alleged um, uh, issues of, uh, um, what was it? Weapons that were not purchased or whatever it is. So the new NSA then says, sorry, we are confiscating this cargo. And it's on the ship. So that was the major issue. So if I gave you, if you like, a formula for that, it won't work for someone who says we found narcotics or who says you brought in used refrigerators which has been banned and all of that. So there can be no one size fits all. But what I would always do is when you have an extrajudicial arrest, please let the court be your last resort. Let your clients know if an, an offense is being alleged. Now let them know this is a crime. And if it's a crime, that is, it, it's, not very, it's not a very good case. So be upfront with them. Let them know that, for instance, if they're able to establish the crime, this is the penalty. Now, some of those penalties come with confiscation of the conveying uh, uh, asset, like a ship, if convicted. So when they know that the worst case scenario, we may, we may lose this entire asset, people might be jailed, then they will understand if you decided in our own crime that you have to use political means rather than legal means to get it sorted. And what that simply means, you have to begin to talk to people who can talk to them to see reasons. Now, of course, it gets to a point that when all that fails, which it did with the case of the answer that, and we had to go to court. But again, when you get a decision, <laughs> who would enforce it against the NSA? 
<laughs> so I think once once you are upfront with the detailed, uh, what I would normally do when I get any case, I will set it out my approach. I will let them know exactly what to expect at each stage. I will give them the worst case scenario, the best case scenario. I will recommend what procedure should be adopted. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm never too optimistic when it comes to criminal matters. But if I get it done easy, uh, faster, it's a plus. Rather than raising hopes, that's why they will chase you every minute. When you, when you have, even when I speak to the NSA and I meet with him and I do that and he says, uh, there's nothing wrong with the ship owner here, but we cannot release the ship here. You just have to be open. And as Mr. Kirani said, you've got to constantly keep the, the club posted closely. We have a policy in our office. If it's an arrest, whatever happens, not, not longer than two hours, club, the, the owners and clubs must know. If it is not too urgent, no later than 24 hours. There must be a report somehow. Whether it's a good report or bad report, of course, there's a way to also present a bad report that doesn't get too bad. Yes. Absolutely. So <laughs> I think it will depend on each uh, agency you are dealing with. But again, don't go to court except you have to go to court. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. I, I can't wait for the QA session. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce. Uh, the next uh, uh, speaker, uh, my very good friend uh, uh, and senior at the bar, uh, Mr. Emeka Akagbogu. Mr. Emeka Akagbogu is the, uh, a partner in Akagbogu and Associate. Please uh, pardon my pronunciation. Uh, so he's, he's, he's an expert in the field of maritime law and policy in Nigeria. Uh, I don't want to go so much into big introduction so that I won't eat into Mr. Emeka's time because I'm sure he's already he's already eager to speak. Mr. Emeka, Mr. Akago, you have the floor. Mr. Akago is speaking on caveats and reparation for needless arrests. Yes. Um, thank you very much, um, Shola, for the introduction. And um, first of all, I'd like to say a big um, thank you to the organizers for the invitation and also to appreciate the um, presentations made by, by seniors, um, the Leonard Silk, the Safemi Atuebi, very erudite and uh, very respected. And also the Leonard Silk, uh, Jin Chiaza Nishere, they've uh, essentially covered the field as it were, as far as um, arrest of um, ships and cargo are concerned. So my responsibility is to speak on the subject of caveats and reparation for needless arrests. Please do confirm that my slide is on the screen. Correct. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so quickly, um, just to uh, go into the, uh, the meat of the discussion. Um, okay, that's just a quick profile. The outline I'll focus on the caveats against arrest of ships, caveats against release of ships and reparation for needless arrests. And hopefully I'll do that within the next 10 minutes or so. Now, what exactly is a caveat against arrest of a ship and why is it important? Now, Mr. Atuebi has clearly set out the importance of um, the ship within the context of commercial operations. Um, of course, um, Ali Kelani also referenced it. Uh, you know, the importance that the PNI clubs attach to ensuring that ships are going to ports and exit the ports as quickly as possible. Because the ships are significant assets, which are not just assets on their own, but they are also laden with even potentially more valuable assets than the ships. So you've got, and then the ships have contingent contracts. So you've got a ship which is um, coming into Lagos, laden with petroleum products. The ship is already contracted upon discharge to pick up products to get to another um, a port within the country, outside the country. And um, you typically have the average ship um, going for charter rates of about 30 to $40,000 per day. So you've got a situation where these are significant sources of income, global commerce, and the lot is um, relying upon their free ease and exit from free entry and exit from the ports. So that's why it's important that the ships 
um, are not arrested, and if arrested, are, are able to exit from the ports and discharge from the arrest as quickly as possible. And that's where caveats come in. If you're a ship owner, you want to, you have to um, deal with the reality that your ship may be arrested. Whether or not there is a dispute, you've got to deal with the likelihood that the ship may be arrested because there are contingent events which you are not in control of and which um, may occur. So despite your best efforts. So you are advised from a due diligence point of view to enter a caveat against the arrest of your ship. That's essentially a, um, uh, an administrative uh, secretarial role, um, which may be undertaken by the ship managing company itself or by the solicitors to the ship. And the essence of the caveat is very simple. The caveat says to the world, the caveat is essentially a notification to the world that this ship should not be arrested because it has, it has deposited within the port an undertaken that if there is a claim against it, it will pay the value of the claim or the value to the limit of the amount which has been registered in the caveat into court as security. Mr. Atebi had told us the essence of the arrest of a ship, which essentially is to provide security for the claim. Simple, to provide security for the claim or to ensure that jurisdiction is exercised over the um, ship or otherwise. So to the extent that this getting security for the claim should be the primary purpose of arresting the ship, to that extent, if the, the, the caveat undertakes to make provision of that security in the event that there is a claim against the ship. So if there is a caveat in place, then the party who would ordinarily be interested in arresting the ship will take advantage of the caveat give notice that the, there's a claim which, um, is, um, which exists against the ship and require the um, caveator to deposit the security in line with the undertaking which has been given. So that's essentially the essence of um, a caveat, um, which, um, uh, is, uh, which you can obtain, which you can file in any of the um, registries of the Federal High Courts um, within the Admiralty Divisions. Um, so the provisions for the caveats um, are set out in Order 8 of the Admiralty Jurisdiction Procedure Rules. Um, and the, it's, uh, the caveats will be filed if the Admiralty Marshal is satisfied that the caveator um, will appear to the suit within three days of being served and provide bail, as I've said. So it's very important, it's an undertaking. And it's important that we set out why um, the caveator undertaking, one, I've already said why it's important, but the person who is um, filing the caveat is also undertaking to ensure that what is required is done because what has been foregone by not arresting is significant. So the Admiral Ad 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 Martin Marshall has to be satisfied that the caveat will appear to the suit within three days of being served, and more important, will provide bail or pay the amount claimed into um, courts. Um, the bail which could be provided uh, could be in the form of a protection and indemnity as the CPNI um, indemnity, or it could be uh, a bank guarantee, um, a guarantee provided by a bank or by an insurance um, company. Um, I'd like to point out uh, again the value of the. So I think what I've set out in this slide essentially shows um, the nature of the security which needs to be provided by the caveator when such a claim has been made. And you know, I, I think enough has been said on that by even uh, Mr. Um, Atuevi. Um, uh, and I think this slide also speaks to the nature of the security which needs to be provided. So I wouldn't say much on that again. The 
caveat expires one year after the day on which it was filed. Now, before I go into the next slide, I'd like to speak on the responsibility on the caveat all, because many times the caveat is filed by a solicitor on behalf of the ship owner. Of course, the ship owner, the ship management company may also file the caveat by, it, by itself, but there are many times when solicitors file on behalf of a, of a, of a caveat all. And the point is, the ship, the solicitor in filing a caveat is undertaking that he will ensure that the ship provides bail upon service of a claim. So when the claim is served, it's not for you to go and start filing some preliminary objection. The first thing you do is to abide by the undertaking which you filed. And if you fail to do that, then it will be deemed that you are in contempt of court. And the court is um, permitted to deal with you as a contempt nor of its proceedings. So it does not matter if you think that the um, if you think that the uh, claim is frivolous. The fact is, to the extent that you've um, undertaken to do what is required, you need to provide that um, that um, you need to provide the um, security as required. Otherwise, the Admiralty Jurisdiction Procedure Rules sets out in Order 20 that indeed you should be liable to contempt and you should face the consequences. Okay, so on this slide, um, essentially it's talking about um, a ship may still be arrested, may, may, may despite the existence of a caveat be arrested. So the existence of a caveat does not guarantee that the ship will not be arrested. In fact, what typically happens is that where the um, because the uh, claimant is required to do a search of the caveat register to confirm that there's no caveat, if he does confirm that there is a caveat, he looks at the amount which has been quoted in the caveat to be the limits that the caveator would be responsible for in the event of a claim. If the claim is above the limits, then the court has the discretion to proceed to arrest the vessel for the simple reason that the caveat does not cover the claim which is being made. However, if the claim is below the amount of the caveat, then the court um, would, should, uh, even though it still has a discretion, uh, but the case, there's a case that there are cell that the court actually should um, obey the existence of a caveat where the amount, where there's a valid caveat in place. Um, uh, very quickly, I'd like to go into caveats against release of ships. Now, so we've talked about caveats um, against arrests, but you may have a caveat against the release, which means that a ship has already been arrested and um, subsequent to the arrest, you become interested in the ship in respect of a different um, matter. So instead of on, uh, filing a new matter um, for arrests, instead of filing for the arrest of that ship, which is already under arrest, you file a caveat against the release of that ship, which is under um, arrest. So that's essentially it. So essentially the caveat against release ensures that the caveator is notified of an application for the release of the ship. Now, um, the case which is on this slide is um, a very useful case. Um, which gives um, which gives some information as to um, what should happen in the event that there's a caveat against release. Essentially, because the procedures for the um, what should happen in the event of a release are not very clear cut, um, this case is very useful to the extent that it says two things. One, the fact that you filed a caveat against the release does not mean that automatically, if um, a ship needs to be released, they'll contact you. However, because it is your responsibility as a caveat to against release to notify the parties in the matter in which the ship is already arrested about the existence of the caveat. 
Because if they do not know about the existence of that caveat, chances are that an application against an application for release will be processed. If the arresting original arresting party is satisfied with the um, provisions for the release of the vessel, it will concede to the release and the vessel will be released. So this case is authority that it is not enough that you um, file a caveat against release. You should take the extra step to ensure that the parties in the existing subsistent matter are notified of the existence of um, this um, caveat against the um, release of the ship. Now, this case is also an authority on a second and equally very important point, which is that the fact that you found the caveat against release of the ship is not enough to found the release of the ship. In addition, you must have a claim in court. So in this particular case, um, the uh, appellant in this particular case um, was the ship which had originally been arrested, uh, was the ship which um, caused the damage. So let us let me just give a two minutes recap of the facts in this case. Um, a ship was already under arrest. And while the ship was under arrest, what in Fela's uh, parlance would be uh, that the body get the accident happened. So the ship was under arrest. And while it was under the custody of the Admiralty Marshal, a second ship collided with it, causing damage to the ship already under arrest. And don't forget that the ship that was under arrest is security for the claim of the party that arrested that ship. So what happened was um, the, uh, the parties who had filed the claim against the, 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 the parties who had filed the claim against the original ship were interested in ensuring that the, the ship which caused the collision um, was not released. At the same time, the owners of the ship under arrest equally arrested the ship that was um, that caused the collision. So the uh, parties entered into some uh, agreements for the release of the ship. So the arresting party are consented to the release of the ship which was uh, which um, caused the collision. And the ship which caused the collision was free to go. However, the party that um, was in the other party that was interested in ensuring that the ship does not sail, which is the party that arrested the first ships in the first place, did not file any matter against the ship that caused the collision. So the court held that having not filed any matter against the ship that caused the collision, it was not enough that they filed a caveat against the arrest of the ship because they have no claim against that ship. Some other party had a claim against the ship, but the party that filed the caveat against the release had no claim against the ship. So to the extent that it had no claim against the ship, it could not rely on its caveat against release, and the, and the caveat did not um, uh, trigger the jurisdiction of the court not to um, release the ship. So essentially, that's the uh, substance of the uh, issue about caveat against release. We can talk a bit more about that because I know that time is uh, fast spent. I'll go very quickly into reparation against um, uh, needless um, arrests because of uh, the time. Now, um, arresting a ship is actually, for all the technicalities around it, actually obtaining an arrest of a ship is simple. It is so simple that uh, many times, essentially anybody can arrest a ship. Whether you've arrested the ship rightly is a different ball kettle of fish altogether. But the fact is, to get a ship arrested is all about filing the right processes in court. And because the courts are um, required to 
grants arrest of ship upon the affidavit evidence which has been presented by the solicitor, most times the courts very likely will grant the arrest of a ship. And that is why there are many cases where ships are arrested, but, but the ships which have been arrested are released because um, the circumstances of the arrest have not met up to the technical requirements of the rules. Now, so if the ship has been released because the ship's arrest was not valid in the first place, that's great. However, the ship has been arrested, probably has spent some days, some weeks, in fact, in, in some cases, some months in custody. What is the remedy of the owner of the ship that has been wrongly arrested? Um, don't forget I told you at the beginning that the ship which has been arrested is ordinarily supposed to be trading and for the period of the arrest is losing quite a lot of money. So um, what's the remedy? The remedy is um, for the claim against um, wrongful arrest, which is um, provided for in um, order 11 of the Admiralty Jurisdiction Procedure Rules. However, the challenge with this is that the um, threshold of proof which is required for the party um, that is claiming um, for reparation for wrongful arrest is quite high because the um, rules is that the court will grant reparation for needless arrest if after the order of arrest is made, either it appears to the court that A, the arrest order was applied for on insufficient grounds or that there was no probable ground for instituting the, the suit in the first place. Now, um, this is the same thing as you have in England, where um, you've got essentially to prove that there was no basis at all in the first instance. Essentially, in fact, you've got to prove that there was mala fide, um, that the ship was arrested in bad faith, in absolute bad faith. But if there were grounds to arrest, um, th then most of the time, the court may not uh, go ahead to um, grant such an um, application, to grant such a, um, a remedy, and that's a challenge. And even in England, it's a challenge. So um, I think I'd like to stop here. So the, the, in, in conclusion, um, it's just to say that, um, uh, as has been said, the essence of the ship arrest is to obtain security for the maritime claim, and that filing the caveat signifies a commitment to provide such a security. Um, where the ship is arrested on frivolous grounds, the arrestor may uh, not will, may be liable for resultant um, uh, losses as um, the case may be. So uh, I'll stop here and thank you very much for the opportunity to make this presentation and take any questions in the course of the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Mr. Akabogu, for that very straight, detailed, but yet loaded uh, uh, presentation on caveats against and repar reparations. I mean, caveats and reparation for needless uh, needless arrest. Uh, before we go into the Q&A, uh, I, I, I was in, because of my interaction with um, many of uh, my colleagues, the young lawyers, uh, they wanted me to talk about um, opportunities for young lawyers uh, in the maritime space. Uh, I'm sure the Leonard uh, Seals, Mr. Femi Atuebi and uh, Mrs. Ninchiazo and Sherry are going to uh, comment on this, but I, I want to start by saying that um, opportunities meet preparation. The first thing you need to do as a young lawyer is to learn, and that's why we have a forum like this, and that's why Mr. Femi Atuebi, Mrs. Jean, uh, Chairs of both learners, uh, senior advocates, Mr. Emeka Kabogu, Mr. Kiliani, and others are here um, to teach us uh, to, to, to share from their own experiences and to, uh, you know, just to chat the way forward. Uh, I remember as a very young lawyer, I was just called to bar. Uh, Chief Richard, I was a junior with Chief Richard Akinjide, uh, SAN, who unfortunately passed on last year during the, uh, during the lockdown. He would send me to Nimasa. I was doing ship registration. I know nothing. I was just out of law school. Go and do ship registration. 
flag registration, cabotage compliance. I, I, none of this were taught me in law school, but I learned them based on my interactions with um, people and I read, gave me opportunity to read. So please kindly take all these things very, 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 very seriously. Very, 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 very seriously. You notice that Mr. Femi Atoebi was very, very concise and straight to the point in, in analyzing the, giving us an overview of all the laws governing arrest convention or the uh, laws uh, uh, governing arrest proceedings in Nigeria. What you are expected to do is to go and look at those laws, the Admiralty Jurisdiction Act, the Admiralty Jurisdiction Procedure Rules, the Constitution, the, I mean, all the laws, and even the case laws he has referred to. Look at them. This is Jin Chia's essay, and I also talked about, about timelines and processes. This, are the, this is what you do. What are you supposed to do? If you're instructed to arrest a vessel, what are you supposed to do? Look at the slide that's going to be shared uh, after the webinar. Study it, ask questions. You can reach out to, to any of the, uh, the panelists. I'm very, 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 in fact, there's something Mr. Atoyebi sent to me as a text. I'm going to read it out. Uh, he said that uh, he welcomed every, it doesn't take any opportunity to be of impact to young lawyers lightly. So you can reach out to him. You have his email. If you don't have his email, go to his website. You see it. This is Jin Chiazza's uh, uh, initial essay. The web, uh, uh, essay, uh, uh, email is on the website. Same with uh, Mr. Akagbogu. Mr. Kelani ended his paper by sharing his email. So you can ask in questions. That's how you learn. That's how you grow. That's how you learn. That's how you grow. So you must learn. You must be prepared. And then the opportunities will come. You know, I was discussing with a colleague of mine who, who since he left law school, all he does is ship brokering, ship brokering. That's what he does. He does not go to court. He does not go to court. He just does ship brokering. That's all he does from beginning to he's a master in ship sale. Whether for scrap, whether that's what he does. All the types of brokering, whether it is charter brokering, whether it is ship owner brokering, whether it is a sell and purchase brokering, he is he so for the for the past 20 years. That's what he's been doing. That's what he's been doing. Why? He learned about it and opportunities came his way. And that's what he's been doing since then. He's married now with children and he's doing wonderfully well. You know, maybe not as much as not as successful as Mr. Femi Atoy and Mrs. Jim Piazzo or uh, Mr. Kagogo and the rest of them. But I mean, he's, he's, he's enjoying his space. So you must learn all of this. There are so many uh, diverse opportunities. You can help with drafting, drafting charter parties, drafting bill of lading. You can't do this if you don't understand the intricate clauses that must be inherent in any of these um, um, legal documents. So you must know them. You must understand charter parties. I know a colleague of mine, um, Gina, in, in, uh, in her office, she, 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 she's out of law school, and she took online courses on drafting of charter, charter parties, on drafting of bill of lading. She's been certificated. She now understands the rudiments. She's growing. She's learning. She's about three, two, three, two years post school, but she understands. When she asks questions, you know she's asking from a, a very informed uh, point of view and all of that. So. The opportunities are very, very, very I, I've, I've done a paper, but I cannot do that. I cannot uh, share my paper because of, uh, of time, because I want us to quickly go into the, uh, the, the Q&A uh, &A session and all of that. You can help with registration of ships. You can help with the registration of ships. Um, a lot of law, uh, young lawyers, um, part, part of the reason why we, uh, myself and some friends put this training together is because we have so many lawyers from YLP, young, uh, uh, sorry, YLF, Young Lawyers Forum, who are emailing me, Fela, please send me precedents on, on, on ship arrests. Please send me ship uh, precedents on caveats. Please, please, please send me, send me precedents on, on this. Send me precedents on that. See, you cannot learn by just copying, slavishly copying precedents. You, you need to be exposed. And that's why we have brought in this very, very rich faculty to really share with us on things that they do on a daily basis. I can't be sharing with you uh, precedents that you don't know how to use. I can't be sharing. You can you just say, ah, it's Shola that gave me, Shola gave me a, a precedent on, uh, on arrest of a vessel. How, how, how am I going to explain that? I don't know the, the instruction you have. I don't know, understand the peculiarity of, 
of, of the case before you. I do not over understand the facts. So how am I going to give you a precedent? You just change, put the party, uh, the plaintiff, the, the defendant, and all of that. That's, that's laziness. Sit down and learn. Sit down and learn. And that is what this forum presents. So there's so many, you can become, an, there are so many lawyers who I know don't go to court. All they do is advisory work. Maritime law, advisory work, advisory work, advisory. One of them is on this forum. I know, I know at least, uh, in fact, about four or five of them, I can see their names here. What they do is advice, legal advice, legal advice. Leg I know him for the past 30 years. I won't call his name. He has never gone to court. He, he was telling me recently that so I don't even know where my wig and gown is. You know, when it is time to go to court, they know who to contact. I will just ship it to those of you who can go and redeem my Lord, my Lord, and all of that. I mean, he is not. He, he's not he's not condemning going to court, but he's just he's just carved a niche for himself. This is what he does. And he's trained himself over the years, attending webinars, attending conferences, attending all sorts of things, you know, to ensure that he learns and he grows. So I encourage every one of us young lawyers here. There are more than 100 of us here on this Zoom platform, and there are many uh, more than 100 of us on the WhatsApp, on the um, Facebook platform, because our panelists should know that. We have people who are joining us on the Facebook platform. There are more than 100 as we speak. So we have collectively almost 300 people watching us live now, or we're attending, we have logged in live here, you know, watching. I, can, I may not be able to take questions on the on the Facebook page. So we'll proceed quickly to the uh, the, the Q&A uh, session. I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Ali Keliani. The last question here from Mr. Abolanle Abdul Salam. He said, I terribly miss the beginning of the presentation. Please, what is the significance of the Ship Owners Club in Maritime Arrest? Mr. Kelani, you want to take that very quickly? Uh, yeah, I'll take that. Um, so we generally, we don't really arrest vessels ourselves. It's when one of our members, one of the ship owners who uh, has insurance with us, when they face an arrest, uh, then we might step in and assist them by putting up a club LOU. And that's quite useful because, um, Bank guarantees are, can be expensive, but LOUs are free and um, they're generally accepted in most jurisdictions as uh, good security. <clears throat> so claimants will accept them. And so that's what we do. We assist. Thank you owners. so much. Thank you so much. Bamid Bidemi Ademola Bello asked a question to Mr. Akagbogu. So I really enjoyed your presentation. I have a question. Can you kindly explain what's con what constitutes wrongful arrest? Does it include actions lost on technical grounds? Mr. Akagbogu, you want to quickly take this? OK, thank you very much. Um, from, from what I've said, the wrongful arrests under the current law in Nigeria mm -hmm. does not necessarily include actions lost on technical grounds. Mm -hmm. So you may have, like um, you heard Mr. Atiebi say earlier on, that, that he's seen many kinds of matters where you've got otherwise good cases lost on the grounds of proceeding against the wrong parties. So um, sistership arrest, for instance, um, uh, section 5.4 of the Admiralty Jurisdiction Act provides clear um, basis on which you arrest the sister ship, ownership of same ownership. So if the basis on which an arrest is discharged is non-compliant with technical requirements relating to the arrests, despite the fact that you otherwise have a good case, then um, it will not constitute wrongful arrests. Okay? And unfortunately, even where you do have um, you, you don't really have such a great case, but there is a prima facie semblance of a basis for you to proceed with an arrest. The status of the law suggests that um, a wrongful arrest proceeding may not be successful as it currently lies. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, I can say Mr. Atoyebi, SN Amazon, but yeah, you have a, you have a question. He said my question is directed to Mr. Femi Atoyebi, so you can take it with your intervention. He said, "I'd like you, sir, to give a clear distinction between action in rain and action in personam." All right, thank you so much, um, Shola. Um, I wanted to comment. I'll I'll come to that question shortly, but I wanted to comment on the last question that Mr. Akabo answered, and I must commend Jamaica. Brilliant, brilliant paper, brilliant paper. Thank you so much on the Caribbean. 
the, the, the last question he answered, I, want, I was going to add, I'm not sure I heard the last thing he said, but what I wanted to say was, if a claim, if, sorry, if an arrest order was discharged unconditionally, without, as he said, and rightfully so, without going to the merits of the substantive claim, the party who owns the ship or who has suffered, suffered damages on account of the wrongful arrest may straight away issue proceedings for damages for wrongful arrest. I, I hope that is very clear. Um, um, if there's any authority needed, there are loads of them, but the latest one we did was in April. The Court of Appeal agreed with us. Someone had, is the, the, the vessel is the MV High Presence. I can provide, it's not reported yet, but I can provide for anybody who needs it, um, the sacristial judgment uh, later. But so someone had arrested a vessel wrongfully, as Emeka said, it may have an otherwise meritorious claim, but I think he proceeded against the wrong uh, ship, thinking it belonged to the party who wronged him and was successfully discharged or dislodged the arrest order unconditionally. And then we didn't, the owners then told us to issue proceedings for damages. So he, he rushed to the court and said, no, this is premature because my case has yet to be decided on the merit. And we argued otherwise, the learned trial judge ruled in our favor that you have already arrested the vessel, they've suffered damages, that arrest has been discharged unconditionally, so you're liable. So you went to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal confirmed the decision of the lower court on that point. So that's just for that. So we do not have to wait until the merit of the case has been decided. If the arrest has been discharged unconditionally. So let me answer the question. An in-rem proceeding is a proceeding against the rest. Against the rest. The rest simply means the fame. The ship, again, I, had, I, I adverted to this in my early uh, uh, submission or presentation this afternoon, which it could be the ship, it could be the bunkers, it could be the cargo, it could be the freight or the hire. That is the rest, the thing, okay? And when you have an action against the rest, you do not need to name any other party. You can just say a cargo of 10,000 metric tons of base oil or 50 metric tons of box cement, whatever it is, as the defendant. It is if the owners choose to join, they can apply to join to uh, or, or provide security for the best, for the car, for the claim. Now, conversely, an action in personam, as it says, is an action against the person. So it's an action against the person who would be liable. That person could be natural or legal personality we're talking about here. So when you name the owners of the ship, the charters of the ship, that makes it an impersonal. Under the past immediate rules, that is the um, 1993 rules, admiralty rules, you couldn't have both an in-rem and impersonal action together. The action would be defeated on that purpose. But under the new rules, I think it's silent. You could do it, but it will come with its own consequences. It, it does have consequences. If you name an owner who is resident abroad, you need to go and serve him, and you need leave to serve him abroad. Uh, I know people have argued to the contrary, but the point is you don't need to join them. It's sufficient to just proceed against the, the rest. So an action against the person is one against the company or the owners other than the rest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lenasi. Uh, this question, I believe, is directed at uh, Mrs. Uh, Jean Chazo and Ishere. Um, two questions, I'm sure you will take them together, uh, from Constance Omagbemi and Abolanle Abu Salam. Um, Constance said, is there a universally accepted definition of the term ship? If yes, please provide it. No, can they comment on this? The second question is, if a warrant can be obtained in three days in anticipation of arrival, what if the ship does not arrive as anticipated and the warrant has been issued? Does that invalidate the warrant, notwithstanding that a warrant is to expire in six months? Mrs. Anishere, you want to take this? 
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Constance, for Mark Demi for that question. Well, no, there is no universally accepted definition for a ship. And this is because of the constant evolution of waterborne crafts, you know, both in offshore and uh, recreational sectors. It's difficult for us to come up with a universally accepted definition of ship. Hence, we have a very wide definition as provided under section 26 of the um, AJA. It's wide enough to incorporate the definition of a ship as provided under the Cabotage Act and the Merchant Shipping Act of 207. In fact, it is the broadness of section 26 of the AJA that had allowed even uh, an engine-less ship cannon to be defined as a ship. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's broad enough. So I, I commend that definition uh, to all. And we don't have a universally accepted definition of a ship. Right, now let's go to Abdul Salam, um, yes. where you've obtained a warrant of arrest uh, before the arrival of the vessel in our territorial waters and the vessel fails to arrive within the period you're anticipating. Yes, indeed, you can still hold on. The warrant subsists for six months or the seven rule three of the AJPR. So you have six months of grace to keep watch on the vessel when it arrives and as soon as it arrives within our territorial waters, you pounce on it, uh, like Christopher Hill says. And again, again, we should remember that the six months is renewable for another six months. That is the warrant of arrest. So if by the sixth month, uh, the vessel is yet to arrive, you could quickly go to the court and have it renewed for another six months to enable you to arrest the vessel when it comes within jurisdiction, when it comes within Nigerian territorial waters, all right? So that's it. Correct, correct, correct. Um, uh, I'm, I believe this question is also for you, uh, Mrs. Ginchazo. Uh, I'm just trying to, so I don't come back. Uh, is it, um, is Nigeria a party to the 1952 or this is this question comes from Dr. Wale Olawoye, Al yeah. uh, Dr. Wale Olawoye, Al Al I, I believe he wants to say something. I, I've already harassed him already. He's my boss, so please forgive me. Uh, he asked, he he's asked a very uh, pertinent question. Is Nigeria a party to the 1952 or 1999 arrest conventions? Are they domesticated in Nigerian law? I believe uh, uh, Dr. Femi Atobi uh, has, has answered this question, but uh, I don't know if you want to comment on it. Uh, I believe uh, Mr. Femi Atobi will also want to uh, answer this question. So, Mr. Jinchaza, you want to comment on this? Yes, indeed. Um, my brother Silk, uh, Dr. Walalawi, thank you for that question. Yes, Nigeria is party to the 1999 Arrest Convention. And that has been domesticated in the AJA, right? And um, where in the AJA, if you look at uh, section two, from section two downwards, section two of maritime claims of the AJA, all the way down. And uh, hence we have, uh, uh, first one to the AJA, we have the Admiralty General Procedure Rules, which prescribe the procedure for enforcement of these maritime claims. So yes, the question is yes, but yes to the 1999 arrest convention. Thank you so much. So I'm putting your notice, Dr. Wale Olawin, yes, and I'll be calling on you shortly to make an intervention. I notice uh, the presence of Mr. Obatundi Ogalaya saying, I also call you to uh, make a few comments today, just one minute. Uh, the next question, I believe, uh, is excellent presentation, Lenny. Must the motion expert for arrest of vessel be accompanied by a similar motion on notice? Yes, um, that's from Max. Thank you, Max. Yes, indeed. Yes. I mean, whatever you have prayed in the motion expert, repeat verbatim on your motion on notice so you're not found guilty of uh, fair hearing. Right, so just <clears throat> everything, but of course, you should know that you cannot arrest a ship twice. Because, you know, when it comes to arrest of vessels, it's not a matter of motion or notice. Now, I mean, the, the ex parte application is to give the promptness to which the vessel should be arrested. 
and we all have had <coughs> why the arrest of the vessel, not for prejudgment uh, security. So it's not like when you're asking that the vessel be detained until the, the when it comes to motion or notice until the matter is disposed of. This is totally not not practicable. This is totally not on. So ship will be released uh, as soon as a bond is placed. As soon as you post the bond, ship will be released immediately for obvious reasons. This is serious business. This is capital intensive, and then you can proceed with your your matter. The vessel should. Let's so get going to his business. You already have a bond in place, the best be a and i club, or you have a bond from the bank or an insurance bond, whichever the court has accepted, whichever the other party finds to be agreeable, and the vessel goes to business. And you just put it with your, with your matter in court. This is totally different from what we normally do uh, when it comes to other matters to which we are seeking interlocutory applications by way of motion and notice, and then we tell the court to make an order pending interlocutory until the matter is disposed of. But simple answer to your question. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Leonard. Uh, Mr. Toyebi wants to make an intervention, but can you just uh, make it with this question, take it together from May Adamu and an anonymous attendee. So what's the, general, what's the purpose of arresting the sheet? But the second question, I believe, that question I believe has been sufficiently answered, but May Adamu says, good afternoon, sir. The current security situation of the country in the country are currently on the start. Is it appropriate for security organizations who do not have powers to arrest, to uh, powers to arrest, to synergize together in arresting Aaron Vessel? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I got that question. I'm not sure I understood that question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think he's trying to ask. Um, the current situation in the country are not uh, security organizations are understaffed. Is it appropriate for security organizations who do not have powers to arrest to synergize together and arrest? More like more or less saying, can they do this when they do not even have enough manpower? Just something along that line. Uh, I'm not so okay. Thank you very much. Shola. I'm not sure I understand May Adamu's question, but. If they don't have power, if you're talking of jurisdiction, then they don't have. Whether they're lean in staff or otherwise, doesn't it doesn't change it. That wouldn't confer uh, power on them to arrest if they don't otherwise have it, uh, if I understood the question correctly. Mm. But I was actually going to add to what my learned brother Silk Jean Chelsea initially said, uh, or a comment on the whether there's a need to also file an application on notice. I'm not sure I got a, a, a comment on that correctly, but the arrest of ships procedure is, is like a just generous kind of cases. It's completely different from the general um, um, interim and interlocutory injunctions or reliefs that you seek, which require that you must file an application on notice, which is identical to the ex parte order. The ex parte order is usually couched in the form of both the application and the order. It's usually couched in the form of that the vessel be and the server arrested pending the provision of security or until the court otherwise orders. So there is no need. Uh, I'm sure that's exactly what she's saying, uh, but it was a bit unclear. But there's no need for uh, for arrest of ships cases to file a motion on notice. It is now for the party affected by the ex-party order of arrest to come to court to try to dislodge it if he wants to. But as far as the arrest is concerned, he's done all that's required of him. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lenny. Um, my. Okay, I think we've answered this one. Um, is the Lloyd's Register? This is from Fum, Fum Naya Mwabuzo. Uh, is the Lloyd's Register the tool for conducting due diligence in determining the ownership of a ship sought to be arrested? Uh, 
Um, let me throw this one to Mr. Kagogo. Okay. Let, let me throw this one to Mr. Kagogo. I'll come back to you. <laughs> Is the lawyer registered the tool for conducting uh, due diligence in determining the arrest, uh, the well, ownership it, of? Uh, I'd, I'd say it could be one, one of the tools. One of the tools. I mean, the lawyer's registry, registry, registry is um, is a private company, um, and yeah. it's uh, has a lot of intelligence relating to ships which have been registered globally. So yes, yeah. it, it could be one of the um, sources. Um, if you do have the subscription, uh, they have several categories of subscription. There's a premium subscription and there's a free one, and there are a couple of other free um internet um free online sources where you could get information relating to vessels but some of them are premium the premium ones have much more information that would be useful in the course of an investigation so but it depends on which register which where is the where is the ship registered so if it is a nigerian registered ship then you can get a lot of information from nimasa um but broadly i think between lloyd's yes and um uh, Equasis. Equasis is a free online source, and it does have. Hello, are you there? All right. Um, incidentally, Mr. Dr. Wale allowing you to ask another question. I think that question has been solved, has been answered. Uh, Dr. Wale Olawe has another question, has another question here to Emeka Akabogo. Are you there, Mr. Emeka? I'm sure any of the panelists can take this. Uh, is there a conceptual distinction between um, a wrongful arrest and a needless arrest, or are they used interchangeably? This question is directed at Mr. Uh, Emeka Kabogu. I think I'm sure any of the panelists can take it. Is there a conceptual distinction between a wrongful arrest and a needless arrest, or are they used interchangeably? Wrongful arrest, needless arrest. Okay, may I comment on that? Please, please do. So. All right. Um, to my learned brother Silk, Dr. Olawoyin. Um, Thanks for that. That's a very interesting, and you know that's coming from an academic mind. Yes, there is, in my <laughs> opinion, there is, there is uh, a, a conceptual difference in my humble uh, uh, view. And what is it? Need, uh, the needless arrest is one, as I understand it, that, that grants you the right to proceed against the vessel, to arrest the vessel. But the question is, do, did you have to in each circumstance? So generally speaking, you're supposed to give a notice, a warning that you're owing me this money, pay me, or give me security. If he says to you, for instance, I'm offering you in response to your letter of demand, if he sent you, uh, it says if he offers you a PI club or indeed not just that, any of the five different types of securities that the Nigerian law recognizes, and you ignored it and you arrested the ship. Yes, you have a right to arrest the ship, but it was needless because you were offered security. Therefore, that is different as against wrongful one. Wrongful one is there is no basis for your arrest. You arrested the wrong vessel. You are looking for uh, uh, Shola Abilu's ship. You went and took um, uh, Emeka Akabu's ship. That's that's completely wrongful. But the first one, you have a right. They offered you security because you wanted to make things difficult. You you rejected security that the law recognizes. It will be needless. In my humble uh, view. Thank you so much. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Jinchia Zohanisha, you want to uh, comment on this as well? Well, I, I, I did them with um, my brother Silk and Atelier BSAN on that wrongful and needless arrest. I just want to add to um, uh, my brother's clarification on uh, Max's question on whether to repeat the prayer sought on an expert application for an arrest of the vessel 
on emotional notice. I just thought I should clarify that for Maxwell, that is, to say that order seven rule one sub one of the AJPR actually has stipulated the procedure for an arrest of a vessel. Indeed, and it's true that order seven rule one sub one did not provide for motion on notice, right? So it's silent on that. You don't need to file a motion on notice. Suffice with your motion ex parte, the affidavit, the rate of someone supports, and, and what have you, which you will serve on the mass of the vessel as a sealed copy, that is. But, so that is important for us to note, for Maxwell to note that you don't need to, for reasons that uh, my brother Silk actually had highlighted, and like I said earlier, this is, this is not like other matters to which you're going to file an interlocutory application by way of motion on notice and what to do. But I know that in practice, I've come across some lawyers who um, served a warrant of arrest on my client's vessel. And one of the documents we received was a motion on notice. And I presume why they did that was because of the practice that whenever you file a motion ex parte, you have to bring a motion on notice. Hence, I said, if you must do that, which is not mandatory, you repeat what you have done ex parte. So my brother Silk has made it succinctly clear that that is not the practice when it comes to ship arrest. And I said that earlier, because ship arrest is a totally different uh, uh, procedure for, for arrest. So you don't need all that interlocutory, for obvious reasons. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, we, we, we're coming to the end of this session, but uh, before then, uh, there are two questions, two or three questions. I, I think, uh, uh, Mr. Femi, I told you be, uh, the last question by blessing Iretio Lua Oloyo Day is directed at you. You may want to know that uh, I think the rules of court will suffice to answer if a motion and notice should be accompanied. With, I'll come back to this question, but I want to let me quickly take the intervention by uh, uh, Dr. Wale uh, Lawi SN and uh, Mr. Uh, Ogala SN. Um, so, Mr. Wale Olawi, you want to quickly make your comment? I know he doesn't want to say anything, but uh, I'm sorry I'm putting you on the spot. You have the floor, Doc. While we're waiting for Doc, if uh, Mr. Babatunde or Galaisen is, is, is available, you want to quickly make a quick uh, comment? Mr. Babatunde or Galaisen. Maybe you need to give them access because the um, Configuration may just allow just the panelists right now. Okay, okay. Um, will the mute please? Uh, would the host please unmute uh, Mr. Babatunde Ogala and Dr. Wale Olawin? Uh, we're going to get back to them, but uh, let's take this question uh, from. My question is directed to Leonard Sig, Dr. Tenato Ibias. In furtherance of his face response on wrongful arrest, what then will be the distinction between wrongful? I think that has been answered already. Peter, a large one, that question has been answered. Um, uh, so that brings us to blessing me, Lua, or lawyer day. I think the rules, of course, will suffice to answer if a motion or notice should be accompanied with a motion with the motion ex party. I know there is an order in the high courts of legal state rules that that states that emotion or notice is a confusion as to the name of ship. Can you bring an action in persona with the in rem action to Dr. Atoyedi SAM? From blessing, Iretio Lua, or lawyer. Thank you so much. I'm not a doctor, I'm a mister. <laughs> <laughs> I can't compete with my aburu, Dr. Wale. <laughs> All right. Um, Again, I, I'm, at, I'm not sure I understood the question correctly, but I do believe I've answered the first part of it on the in rem and in personam action. If you don't mind, could you explain to me? I heard you, but I didn't understand the question, the second part of it. So my question is, if there is a 
confusion as to the name of the ship of ship. Can you bring an action in personam with the in rem action? I, believe, I think I think that has been you, you've actually answered. You can that. you can have both. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can have both um, yeah. an in rem and in personam action today. Uh, yeah different from the old rules, you can. But it's not difficult, and I think Emeka Akabo really dealt with this. It's not difficult to know the name of the ship that you are proceeding against. Apparently, invariably, there would be some documents, whether bill of lading, whether mates received, that will contain the current ship. The word is, it will be there, which is why Allied Trading Company against GBN says, you have a duty to undertake a diligent search. Of the name of the okay. ship and the owner that you want to you want you want to proceed against. So, but if you are not sure, put the name of the ship, put the owners of as in as in the title owners of rather than trying to get the correct name because that's very tricky. Oh, that helps. Okay, I think it does. It absolutely does. Um, do we now have Dr. Wale Olawo online? Can the host please unmute yep, Dr. Wale Olawo? Yes, Mr. Allah, thank you very much for yeah. the um, um, opportunity. Even though I told you that I, I wanted to just fly under the radar and listen in. Um, just, I guess, just one quick point. The reason why I posed the question about um, domestication of the arrest convention is because um, I have personally struggled about whether or not uh, Nigeria uh, domesticated um, any of those two conventions. Um, I, I see that Landed Senior Advocates, um, uh, uh, Jin Chiazo and uh, uh, Mr. Femi Atobi say that we uh, domesticated the 1952 uh, convention. I know that we signed and ratified the 1952 convention. Um, uh, 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 and in the Admiralty Jurisdiction Act, as uh, Mr. Atobi has referred to, and uh, uh, this is Jean Chia's or two as well. Um, section two uh, and section five are pretty much in line with the language of the convention. But whether we formally domesticated it, I, I think is still up in the air. As regards the 1999 constitution, we signed it, but we never ratified it. Uh, so, I mean, and, and people would understand that when a country is going to domesticate a convention, it's it's it, it's it's more or less a three-stage process. You first of all sign the convention, you ratify it, and then you domesticate it into your into the corpus of your local laws. Um, so, as regards the 1999 constitution, we didn't even do the second stage. Talk less of having it domesticated in our laws, even though the language of the 1999 con uh, uh, convention is very similar to the 1952. But you know that there are some significant uh, 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 change of language in the 1999 constitution that we don't have in our own law. So I just needed to make that clarification about the fact that uh, perhaps uh, uh, we, we could have a discussion about whether or not there was even a proper domestication of the arrest conventions in Nigeria as we know it, or we just cherry picked uh, a certain language in the convention, we embedded it in our domestic laws. And does that mean <laughs> domesticated those conventions just because we did that? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Sorry, I'm in the time. I'm rushing to you like to do an invigilation. Sorry, Shola. If Thank I may so just, much. if I may just chip in this, Shola, to what Lannis and Advocate have just said. I see that I've please stuck me. I've stayed. <laughs> no, no, that's, I'm, I'm in agreement with you that I wanted to confirm that there is no formal domestication of either. Yeah. Now, what we have as um, Mrs. Uh, Chazo Eishere has rightly pointed out is that they handpicked certain sections from the 1991 convention and inserted it in our AJA. But that's, that's not the same thing as domesticating it. If you remember the Hague rules, usually the first stage, which Dr. Lawan has kindly explained to us, when you want to domesticate, is the act would, in the recital, would specifically says, wherefore, 
So, 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 and it will refer to that convention and it now says right. it is thereby. Right. So, to answer the question, I agree with Dr. Olawan, neither of them has been formally domesticated. And in 1963, don't forget, there was no, there was in the 1963 constitution, as far as I can remember, there was no requirement for formal domestication. We were just newly independent, unlike under the new constitution, under the 1999 constitution, which says you must dem dom domesticate it. And then the various decisions of the Nigeria Airways cases uh, on that point, you know, on the unification of certain rules for carriage of goods by air. So there is no domestication of either of the two. And in 1963, it was not necessary in 1963. But in, by 1991, it became necessary. We haven't done it, but they just picked it and put it in the uh, AJ, which to me, without due respect, has the same effect, with the exception of any uh, uh, section that was not cherry picked, to borrow the expression of the National Advocates. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we now have uh, Dr. Babatunde Ogala, SN? Uh, online, uh, I'm not sure it's still, uh, it uh, Okay, like, can I just quickly take two interventions from, I see Ogbonaya Agba for your hands have been raised up for a while and Abdul Basit, Abdul Malik. Can the host please unmute um, Abdul Basit? Okay, Abdul Basit, your hands are down. Ogbonaya Agba for, um, you want to quickly ask, uh, if you have a question, would the host please Omnute Ogbon Naya Agbafo. We'll quickly take this as the last question and then we'll try to summarize. Ogbon Naya Agbafo. Okay, we have Babatunde Ogala online. We have Babatunde Ogala. You're welcome. Let us see this and then the last question from the QA. And then we'll... Ogbon Naya Agbafo, please proceed. Unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I wasn't really going to ask a question, and actually, my hand was up on, in error, but uh, I, I want to take the opportunity to thank all the panelists, brilliant, resourceful gentlemen. Thank you very much for enriching us. And uh, it, cannot, it couldn't have been better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Agbafo. Thank you so much. Do we have Mr. Galan? Are you ready now? You are on mute. You can go ahead. You have unmuted yourself. Let us see if you can please proceed. Okay. Okay. I think we're just, we're just going to proceed with our last question from Peter. Peters Okome. Uh, I believe this question has been answered, but it's directed at please. This is my question for the learners. Where a ship is alleged to have breached a contract in Port of Lomé, can the ship be arrested in Nigeria? Uh, I think it has been answered, but um, it's directed at Mr. Toye BSN. Um, quick comment on this before we close. Learners. I switched off for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I switched off for a second. So the question is, please. Where is ship is alleged to have breached a contract in ports of Lome? Can the ship be arrested in Nigeria? Of course, anywhere in the world. Anywhere, the presence, the physical presence yeah. of the ship in Nigeria is what, again, we dealt with this earlier, I believe, is what confers jurisdiction of the Nigerian court to arrest her. A lot of the claims that we see in Nigeria were not causes of action that accrued in Nigeria. They accrued elsewhere. And if you remember, it was the third reason I gave as the purpose for arresting the ship, to confer on the court right. the jurisdiction which it would not otherwise have had. So the answer is yes. So long as the vessel is there. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think we've sufficiently dealt with all, uh, if not all, all the questions. Unfortunately, more questions, uh, well, we've been able to take more questions. Uh, our time is far spent, but I just thought to, I mean, it's not easy to bring this um, array of um, very enriching and experienced uh, faculty to share with us um, on their own knowledge and experience. Um, so permit me to... Um, Chidima, before I say anything, you want to make a quick comment for on behalf of the organizers before we close? Okay, yes. Um, we would like to appreciate all our panelists and uh, Leonard Silks that are on this webinar. We really want to thank you for um, honoring us with this, um, to, uh, attending this webinar, sorry. Um, 
Mr. Shola, you really did an amazing job. Thank you for this um, amazing, um, I'm addressing this session. Uh, please note, we'd also like to say that Mr. Shola is a principal partner at Southgate Solicitors. Uh, he has been introducing everybody, but he hasn't introduced himself. Yes. So um, we look forward to having you on more of our webinars and um, we look forward to having our, um, Leonard Silks on more of our webinars. A very big thank you to our sponsors, Alex, GLS and Co, um, Bloomfield Law Practice and Advocate Law Practice for making this webinar possible today. Thank you to our attendees and to all our active attendees asking all the um, questions. Thank you so much. Our next webinar series will be on Friday by 11 a.m. and topic will be on tax appeal. So um, next week Wednesday, um, uh, that topic on litigating with electronic um, um, litigating using electronic processes in civil cases, and we have. Um, uh, three, uh, uh, three of our learned silks are going to be a panelist on that particular uh, webinar. So I will leave it to Mr. Ojola to end with the rest of the webinar. Uh, oh yeah, you pretty much done my job. So uh, uh, mine is just to, to thank uh, Mr. Femi Atoyebiese and thank you. Uh, and please uh, forgive me for all my troubles. I've been bothering Mr. Femi Atoyebi since uh, uh, sometime last week, and uh, I, there's no day of the week. I don't ever send me text message, a WhatsApp message, and the response, Shola, I have seen it. I will attend, and we did attend. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Femi Atoyebi, for making time out of a very busy schedule to um, yeah, Mrs. Uh, Jinchia was only sharing saying, my very big auntie in Lagos. I appreciate you for your time. Uh, thank you for gladly accepting our invitation. And thank you for the very, very uh, intellectually stimulating paper you presented, uh, which will be shared to uh, our young lawyers. And please uh, forgive, I would like to apologize on uh, ahead because uh, your emails have been circulated uh get ready your phones will start buzzing and young lads will be calling me mr you said so 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 please can you help me my principal said it, so please uh get ready for i'm just giving you so because i know how we do young lawyers for him and all of that uh mr ali kiliani my very good friend uh thank you for for honoring our invitation uh if not for coronavirus who knows, I may be in London with you at the ship owner's office so we can drink tea, coffee, or have lunch and then talk about uh, business. But I'm sure as the as, uh, we are getting out of the woods by the grace of God, and I'm sure in no distant time we'll have more opportunities to meet. Uh, but please, um, I'm giving you notice that we still call you for uh, other, other uh, forums that we're going to have. I mean, on this and other platforms. So thank you so much, Mr. Kelly and Thank you so much, Mr. Mecca Akabobu, my, my very learned senior. He has been my senior right from the days, you know, Mr. Bakoba and Associates, uh, my senior to today. Thank you for uh, ever growing and ever setting the pace and ever charting the course and ever directing us on uh, how to learn and how to grow every day. Uh, I thank you, uh, my hosts at Esquire. Thank you for having this uh, very brilliant session. Thank you to all the attendees on this Zoom platform and on the Facebook uh, platform, which I'm monitoring once in a while. Thank you so much, and do have a pleasant evening. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye-bye.